thing is the Oliver Center for providing the videotaping. Again, these are all on our website. Well, welcome everybody. Um, I have nothing particularly creative to say to start the presentation, so I think we'll just get going in the uh, interest of time here. So I have no conflicts of interest to disclose with uh, um, regard to this particular presentation. And this is kind of the uh, layout for what we're going to discuss today during my part. Uh, for advice on particular exercises or how to perform something like that, so I'm going to leave that to uh, Chad. He's more the expert on that side of things. I'll go over some of the background for exercise, the biology of the aging human body, the benefits of exercise to the aging human body, and then some suggestions for training as we uh, go forward through healthy aging. So. Um, so let's talk about Masters Athletes. There's a lot of talk in recent years. There's even now some courses, presentations, lectures, et cetera, through both our Sports Medicine Society as well as our Academy of Orthopedic Surgeons on the care of the Masters Athletes. And uh, if you look at some of the recent data, we can see that participants in uh, recent endurance activities and competitive sports are in general older. They're participating longer, meaning throughout their lives, and are able to compete with or outcompete both their historical comparison groups, meaning people in their own age group, or even some of their younger competitors. And uh, physical activity, we know, may slow or prevent some of the age-related declines that we typically would think about as we get older. More than 850,000 adults over the age of 40 participate in triathlon events. That is a full marathon. Uh, my wife, who is over the age of 40, has participated in two half triathlons thus far in her athletic career. And a study, as you can read, of more than 900,000 marathon participants showed that 25% of runners in their mid to late 60s outperformed half of those aged 20 to 54. So what does that mean? What does that mean to anybody in the room? What it means is that if you are physically fit and you maintain that level of physical fitness over the course of your lifetime, you can continue to achieve your athletic and activity uh, goals. As human beings have gone along here over the past uh, several decades, that marathon times continue to improve, and that's with improvements in physical training, nutrition, as well as people who are continuing to stay active as they continue to get older. So what are the effects of aging on the human body? Let's go over some of that. So let's talk about bone, progressive decline in mineral density, especially in the perimenopausal period, especially in women, of course in women. There's an increased risk of fractures, and both men and women lose bone mass after the age of 40. What about good bones? What is good bone versus bad bone? What is normal healthy bone versus osteoporotic bone? Um, and how do we protect our bone as we get older? Master sprinters aged 40 to 85 maintain overall bone strength, density, mineral content, and bending strength in the tibia, which is the lower leg bone between your knee and your ankle. <coughs> a study by Song and colleagues reported a six to nine percent increase in T-scores. Those of you who've gone to your doctor and had your uh, bone density test done know what that means. In the upper femur, that's uh, this part here near the hip, in women who participated in regular Tai Chi for six months. And that's low impact exercise, but it still provided benefit to uh, overall bone strength. Muscle, use it or lose it. Here's a paragon of somebody who continues to exercise, lift weights, and stay fit as he gets older. I don't even know how old Sylvester Stallone is now because you can't tell, right? <laughs> <coughs> so what do we do as we get older? We tend to lose muscle mass in both our type one, which are the more the structural postural muscles, and the type two, the fast twitch fibers, ones for explosive movements. There's a decrease in muscle fiber size and the number of motor units in our muscles, so muscles tend to atrophy and shrink over the course of time, which is why Arnold Schwarzenegger doesn't look today like he did 30 years ago. And there's loss of force production, flexibility, and overall function in your muscle. But here's the good news. What can we do about it? So a study by uh, Robluski et al. studied recreational athletes over the age of 41 who maintain a highly active lifestyle training four to five times per week and they found that there was no decline in mid-thigh muscle area, peak quadriceps torque, that's the muscle in the front of your thigh, or quadriceps strength. So yes, if you use it, you actually get to maintain it. Another study of uh, middle-aged and older women uh, who exercise at least twice per week, that's two times out of every seven days, I'm sure we can all handle that, uh, gain strength and neuromuscular balance compared with their age match controls. And balance is something that is extremely important as we age, as it can stave off the risk of falls, which are a huge cause of morbidity and mortality as we get older. Again, a little more on muscle. Adults between the ages of 50 and 80 who perform regular vigorous aerobic exercise, that's running, treadmill, elliptical, cycling, swimming, something, uh, show greater quadriceps strength and increased quadriceps muscle mass. So improving and maintaining the strength and size and tone of your muscles. 
Resistance training, that's strength training, lifting weights, using resistance bands, can promote gains of 10 to 13% in muscle strength, 5% in functional power, and 6 to 16% in sit to stand and dynamic balance. And again, those transitions or transfers, going from a sitting position to a standing position, having the strength and the balance to just get up and go and not have to think about, not have to wait for it, not have to wait for your body to get ready to go, um, are measures of overall health as we continue to get older. As you can see, National Senior Games competitors have significantly greater knee flexion extension strength compared with their age match controls. What does that mean? It means that elite senior athletes are in better shape and can continue to perform better than those in their same age group who do not exercise or train. What about our tendons and ligaments? What are tendons? Tendons attach muscle to bone, ligaments attach bone to bone. We need them both. Aging causes loss of tendon ligament compliance or flexibility. It can get breaking or cracking like these green stick fractures seen in this branch right here. And that can increase the risk of injury and loss of athletic performance. You all know about the older people or maybe we have colleagues or friends who've gone out for a run or to play sports and they tore their Achilles tendon or they ruptured an ACL or tore their biceps trying to pick up something heavy that they could have done five, ten years ago. I'm sure some of you have experienced some of that. So what about exercise? What can that do for us? Athletic men ages 63 to 73 had patellar tendon mechanical properties and volume similar to those of active subjects in their 20s. And just think about that. People 40 to 50 years older. Patellar, is, is that the knee? Below the kneecap, from the kneecap down to the tibia. That is the point through which your quadriceps muscle extends your knee. It's a critical part of being able to maintain knee extension and strength as we walk, stand, and get up from a sitting position. And as you can see, if you maintain athletic lifestyles and performance, you can maintain that uh, fitness in your body. You can see that women who are older who engage in cycling or low load resistance training show again increased patellar tendon size and quadriceps elasticity, the ability of the muscle to contract and relax effectively to reduce the risk of injury. What about the cartilage or the joint surfaces inside our knees? The cartilage is the tissue that lines the ends of the bones. Next time you eat a chicken drumstick, take all the stuff off the end of the bone and look at that white glistening stuff on the end. That's the cartilage. That's what allows our joints to move smoothly without pain, right? Older adults who exercise regularly, and you can see the variety of exercises that were named in the literature that I reviewed to put this together, maintain thicker knee cartilage. You can prevent or slow down the effects of arthritis as we age by maintaining a regular exercise lifestyle. And I think as it's noted here, you see a variety of exercises, and I think it is important to maintain a variety of exercises to reduce the risk of overuse injuries or repetitively doing the same thing to your body over and over again. All right, adults who increase their quadriceps muscle mass maintain greater kneecap cartilage over the course of time. The stronger the muscle, the better protects the joints. So what about training regimens and suggestions? This is going to kind of dovetail with what Chad's going to go over with us today. What about weight training? The ability to increase muscle mass, lean muscle mass, and bone mass or density uh, will occur with resistance training. You can decrease fat. Yes, you don't just have to run for days on end to try to reduce fat. If you combine running with resistance or weight training with some of the other things we're going to go through here in the next couple of slides, that improves overall physical fitness. It improves the shape of your body, your uh, overall um, strength. Heavier weights and lower repetitions for trained adults provide better results. So only if you've been lifting weights over the course of time should you try to lift heavier weights with lower repetitions. That increases the size of the muscle, the strength of the muscle, the explosive power of the muscle. Compound movements, what does that mean? That means the, the big weightlifting movements that involve multiple muscles at the same time. A simple biceps curl is just that, it's just a biceps curl but a lat pull down or a row involves both your back muscles as well as your <laughs> biceps muscles. Doing squats versus knee extensions, an extension only works your quadriceps. A squat or a leg press can involve your quadriceps, your hamstrings, your glutes, multiple muscles trained with one movement so everything grows in balance. Plyometrics or explosive movements can also be beneficial. Again, you've got to make sure you warm up effectively, but to do explosive movements increases the explosive power, the ability to get up and go when you want to go. Endurance training, everybody tries to do this, right? The walking program, the daily run, whatever it is. Sustained and moderately intense aerobic training is good for the heart, increases the body's ability to absorb and use oxygen, decreases fat accumulation, maintains muscle mass, and maintains joint cartilage. Does anybody see anything there that doesn't look good, right? <laughs> so um, I'm all for that. 
right? You can do endurance training that's not quite so intense and still see some physical benefits from it. Increasing one's walking speed and number of daily steps can increase the benefits of daily walking regimens. So everybody who's got their Fitbit, good. Keep using it. My wife has one, seems like everybody in my family has one nowadays to count the number of steps. The more the number of steps you do, the faster you walk, uh, the better, the more healthy you can be. What about doing, as we talked about, a variety of exercises? So not just running, not just walking, finding other ways to stay fit. Occasional sessions of varied forms of exercise can maintain heart health and muscle mass and decrease the overuse injuries from repetitive impact. That's so much of what I see in my own practice is overuse injuries, whether it's in older individuals or especially nowadays in our youth athletes, a lot of your kids and grandkids, all right? What are they doing? They play baseball 24-7, 365, and they pitch. That's all they do all year long. That is very bad, not only for the developing body, but for the adult body as well as the aging body. Throughout history, we never did that as people, right? You either run away from a saber-toothed tiger and climb a tree and go swimming after something. Nowadays, because of sports, because of the influence of money and everything else in sports, people tend to focus on one particular activity and it's not good for the human body. Flexibility and balance training, dynamic active warm-ups prior to exercise. Get the body warmed up. Get it ready for your exercise. Don't just dive right in cold. Uh, static stretching after workouts can help to maintain the flexibility gains that you've achieved during your active workout. And as you can see, one study showed that women aged 50 to 60 who performed Tai Chi for six months were less fearful of falling. Why? Improved balance, improved neuromuscular control, improved confidence in their bodies. Again, use it or lose it. Older women who exercise three times or more per week with moderate intensity maintain muscle and bone strength. Very simple, right? What about nutrition? I wouldn't necessarily recommend this, but it was a funny <laughs> slide just in case. All right, so what do we need? Protein, one to 1.5 grams per kilogram of body weight per day when you are actively exercising. What about carbs? Now carbs are not all bad. We need carbs for energy. Six to eight grams per kilogram body weight per day. Again, it's capitalized when actively training, not when you're just sitting around watching TV or reading a book. You shouldn't eat that much, but if you're actively involved in exercise, your body needs carbs to maintain your energy level. What about supplements? <laughs> exactly. So. What about creatine? That's a very popular one amongst younger athletes, weightlifters, bodybuilders. It enables increase in longer work during exercise and augments muscle growth. When combined with increased protein intake, greater strength gains may be achieved, but it dehydrates the body and the benefits of it in the older population are not really uh, known yet. And human growth hormone, there's a lot of uh, discussion about this. Is it used by pro athletes? Some kids want it because they think it'll make them grow bigger so they can be better in high school sports and get that college scholarship they really want to play football or whatever it is. No strength gains and no evidence to support its use to augment training. And obviously we do not support or promote the use of performance enhancing drugs like steroids. Finally, we'll talk about arthritis. So moderate intensity aerobic exercise effectively maintains cartilage compliance and does not increase the risk of knee arthritis. Notice the not, moderate intensity aerobic exercise. Regular stationary cycling lowers pain and stiffness and increases gait velocity. Again, the ability to walk faster, improving the, uh, the benefits and the efficiency of your workouts <clears throat> in older patients with knee arthritis. So yes, even if you have knee arthritis and you walk, you can improve your health and you can feel better. And of course, the last one, quadriceps weakness is linked to frequent complaints of pain in older adults with knee arthritis. This is something that my uh, fellowship director in, uh, in Detroit in sports medicine tried to emphasize to me, that the quadriceps acts like a cushion for the knee joint. The stronger the quadriceps muscle, the less the knee bothers people. And it's true, we've seen it a lot. Um, so what about some final thoughts for everybody here? So a lot, a lot of the data is based on uh, people with older folks with knee arthritis, hip arthritis, and in terms of physical activity, uh, the ability to get up and walk, the ability to prevent falls, and the, uh, and the associated uh, morbidity, loss of independence, loss of life that can come from that, a lot of that is based around, it's not just the knee joint itself, it's the muscles that support and surround the knee. And the quadriceps is considered to be the most important muscle, it's the most powerful muscle group in the body. It is the muscle group whose strength is what allows us to get up and stand up straight, 
to walk effectively, to get up from a sitting position effectively, and to maintain our balance. So these principles, these are all just principles, but a lot of the data has been done a lot in that muscle and with that joint because you know knee arthritis or knee pain is maybe the most frequent complaint that I'll see in my practice. And I think that's probably true for most orthopedic surgeons as well. Um, but you can apply these same principles to the other joints and the other parts of your body. Do you have a question? Or are you just thinking hard? Okay, so what about a suggested training regimen? So the four primary areas of exercise, once again, are resistance training or weight lifting, endurance or aerobic exercise, balance training, and flexibility training. A combination of regular resistance or weight training and endurance training most effectively offsets the health problems of a sedentary lifestyle that means sitting around and doing nothing, right? Why exercise? Here's why. Exercise has been linked to decreased morbidity or, or, or chronic illness, loss of strength, loss of independence, and increased average life expectancy. Yes, you may live longer and in better health if you continue to exercise. There are psychological benefits. There's lower rates of anxiety and depression in people who exercise regularly, and higher rates of self-esteem, uh, self and helps you feel better about yourself in the way that you feel when you look in the mirror. And that's all I have for everybody today. So. Some questions. Um, what about the uh, person who has already had a knee replacement in terms of exercise? I've been told no running, no jumping, and no kneeling. So I just like to hear your thoughts. So as somebody who performs knee replacement surgery, I do get asked this question quite a bit. And I am not against people who have had the surgery exercising. The question is what kinds of exercises can you do safely? <coughs> So a lot of the things that we showed here with uh, impact, higher impact activities, we would recommend against for the knee replacement because of the risks of causing wear of the components or loosening of the components from the knee. However, it doesn't mean you can't do a daily walking regimen, swimming, cycling, elliptical training. You can do some light resistance training or weightlifting. You can certainly exercise your upper body, do the core strengthening. You can do a lot of the stuff like the Tai Chi and the balance training. So all of those options are there. Probably the only thing you really can't do is run or jump, and some surgeons are for kneeling and some are against kneeling, and that's just between you and your individual doctor. What is an example of low, low load resistance training? Uh, sure, so that means just decreasing the amount of weight that you're using. So doing a leg press with say 20, 30, 40 pounds instead of 200 to 300 pounds. And, more repetitions. and you can, if you can do more repetitions, then yes, it's whatever your body can tolerate. So which one is better then? It, all, it depends on you and your body. If you've been working out, if you've been lifting weights for many years, and you have the strength to handle those increased loads of a heavier weight, then you're safe to do so. If you're just starting out, or you just want to maintain your level of fitness and muscle tone, then lower weights or medium reps and higher, uh, excuse me, lower weights and medium weights or higher reps or medium reps are better for you. Yes. Uh, you said the quadricep muscles was important for uh, preventing knee injury. Where are those muscles located? Front so, of your leg? Or yeah, so the quadriceps muscle extends from the hip joint across the front of the thigh and attaches to the top of the kneecap or patella and then attaches through the patellar tendon down into the lower leg or tibia or shin bone. And that's what allows us to straighten out the knee. So classic exercises associated with the quadriceps, and, and Chad can go over more of this with you as well, are knee extensions, leg presses, or squats. And those are the typical exercises that we do for the quadriceps. Sorry, there are too many questions. That's okay. I see only women here, meaning that we have more time to come here, or do men need it less? They stay longer in shape. Sorry for I think uh, <laughs> Dr. Muir can probably talk to that, but I think the program is mainly directed towards Women, is that true, or? Well, we, we like to include men as well, um, but most of the topics are aimed in that direction. Men don't need it less. No, it's just as important for both men and women. I just directed most of the talk towards women because I figured that would be more of the target audience, but as you'll see here in a few minutes, uh, we have a man here who can tell you all about it, so. so. You do more labor for men or women? Uh, that is a very good question. I'd probably say women, but not by much at least in my particular practice. I have a quick question about arthritis. So many people suffer from arthritis, and I'm very happy I don't have any arthritis. How do I keep from getting arthritis? Just moving. Not just moving, but moving is the best way to stay away from it. 
I mean, it's uh, you know one of Newton's laws, a body in motion stays in motion, a body at rest tends to stay at rest. And I think if we stay active, we can continue to remain active. And then varying the types of stress on the body is something that I emphasize to all of my patients. Again, cross-training. Find something to do and then do something else and then do something else. The more the variety of exercise that you do, the better off you will be because you will vary the stresses on your body and not overuse or put too much pressure or impact on any one part of your body. And uh, with that, yes, one more question. Go on her question. It's difficult. Is arthritis preventable? I think that's a very debatable topic. It's a very challenging question to answer. I don't think it is truly preventable. Um, there are so many different causes for it. Some are genetic, some are work-based, some are sports-based, some are injury-based. Uh, some have to do with um, diseases such as rheumatoid arthritis or inflammatory conditions. So because there's so many different causes and because each individual may have different components of all of those, it is a, extremely difficult to truly prevent all forms of arthritis. Um, however, one can mitigate the impact of arthritis on one's life by trying to follow some of the principles that we've gone over today of varying the stresses on your body, continuing to maintain good physical fitness, and obviously trying not to get hurt. So basically, I'm gonna kinda just build off of what he's already gone. He pretty much covered a lot of this sub, uh, topics in great detail, so my job is going to be much, much easier to kind of just kind of come in behind him. Um, when I initially think about the presentation, you know, my thought was we're like, well, I'm sure I'm going to get a lot of questions like, what specific exercises can I do? We could talk about that for weeks and weeks. I mean, if you think about it, there's a million different ways you could exercise. So again, to, to go over there and to individualize each individual exercise, again, I think we would be here forever, and I'm sure y'all don't want to spend that much time with us. Um, so again, more or less kind of going up based on the topics that he was talking about. And again, um, thinking about it from an individual standpoint. So while we're going through this, I want each person to think about themselves specifically and how you as an individual can exercise um, as we go along. So again, basically we're thinking what you need to know to get you on the go. So I'm not going to give you a specific exercise to do, but again, kind of give you a recipe on how to create uh, your specific plan. Um, so some of my objectives uh, for y'all today is to think about the influences of fitness and performance. Dr. Brooks has already gone into this quite well, so I'll kind of, I'll kind of, kind of paint a little bit on that. Uh, some of the physiological changes that we occur as we age, again, touching on some of the things that he's gone over. Uh, how exercises need to change as we age. I think this is where the important thing is because, um, you know, we watch TV, we look at magazines, and you, you see these pillars of health and stuff like that, and so everybody kind of tries to model or emulate that look like, well, how do I look like this? Um, so we need to realize that you know something that you do as a 20-year-old doesn't necessarily reflect what you need to do as 40, at 60, 80, or above that. Um, and also, uh, I thought it was important to kind of go over signs of overtraining. I think that you know, as people start seeing success, then that kind of motivates people to continue on and go more and push more. So I think it's also good to look at the other end of the spectrum. You know, how do I know I'm pushing myself too hard? It's good to get going, but how do I know? Because it is uh, bad to your, or detrimental to your health if you push yourself too much. So I think it's also crucial to kind of discuss, you know, one, getting yourself going, but how do I know if I'm going over the edge? Uh, physician clearance. This is where it's important. Before you start any exercising, check with your doctors first. Um, because again, you want to make sure you, only, any underlying conditions or stuff are addressed, uh, any type of restrictions or anything other things are you know, discussed in detail before you start any kind of activity because um, you know, exercise is induced trauma to the body. I mean, you're creating changes at the cellular level. You're putting stresses on different tissues. Um, so again, making sure that you're medically clear and healthy for different types of exercise. You know what, what can I do as an individual? And I'm going to keep using that word individual because again, Everybody in here, I don't see any identical twins. Is, so everybody has going to have their own specific workout program. So again, not trying to copy so much what somebody else does because the results are going to be completely different. Uh, how your body responds, it will be completely different. So what influences? Some of the things uh, Dr. Brooks has already kind of talked over a little bit. Genetics. Again, everybody is different. I can't stress that enough. So you know, we saw Schwarzenegger. Uh, we talked about, I mean, sorry. Uh, Sylvester Stallone, Schwarzenegger, those are just, you know, a couple people in the billions of people on this planet. They do what they do and it works for them. What everybody else does in here specifically, 
may not work exactly the way or get the same results. So you can't expect, I'm going to look like that or look like Jack LaLanne or any of these other individuals that you see, there have been pillars of health and fitness. Um, the way you're built and the way you're born, that's just the way, you know, you can only blame your parents for that. So you, you, what you, hard you're dealt, you're dealt. Uh, age is another thing we can't control. You know, every day we, we're a day older or a year older. Um, the body does break down as we go along. That's to be expected. But again, it's like a, a car. You have to fine tune that engine or tune it up to get it to run efficiently. The human body is a perfect machine. Well, I'll say perfect, but pretty close to the most perfect machine we have. So again, but it does require maintenance and you know, tune-ups here and there to get it to run optimally. Uh, nutrition. I think nutrition is just as important as the actual exercising itself. Uh, just like a car, that analogy there. If you don't put gas in the car, the car don't go. So again, what you put in your body really dictates how well you do as far as performing at any age. So again, um, again, I think it's really important as you get older, really look at what you're putting in your mouth and what are you having in your diet. Uh, because that, you'll, you'll find the better you eat, the better you perform, the less illnesses, the less risk for falls. All the other um, ill things that can happen to you, again, can be definitely reflected by your nutritional um, sleep rest really ties into that. Uh, that's usually the easy thing to, to talk about with people because, oh yeah, sleep rest, no problem, got that covered. Uh, but how much sleep and how much rest are you getting? How is rest working into your workouts? Are you working seven days a week? Are you working you know, eight hours a day? Are you getting enough rest in between this? It's not just sleeping at night. It's how, allowing these muscles to get these rest periods because when you exercise, you break down the muscle tissue. So then they, therefore they have to rebuild. Are you giving them enough time to rebuild or are you just constantly knocking the house of cards down and not letting it build back up? So again, as you're working out, think about that. Am I getting enough time to let these tissues heal up? Because again, a lot of times if you don't let them rest, again, that's where you get that constant soreness. Like, you know, I'm sore, but it never goes away. Well, you got to think about, well, are you doing the same exercises every single day, two or three times a day? That's where Dr. Brooks is talking about a little variation. If you're working upper body, maybe next time to go to your lower body. Again, giving those tissues time to recover and rest. Proper training, I think uh, this is also good because again, you know, we're, we're creatures of habit and again, we like to talk to other individuals and stuff and they, they always come up with these good ideas. You see these fads on TV, right now everybody loves CrossFit. So everybody goes out and does CrossFit. So again, but again, there's people that have done, you know, uh, masters athletes, there's, you know, expert trainers that, you know, they could probably get away with that jumping into that. But what about the individual that's never exercised and they're saying, wait, CrossFit makes you look good. So why don't I do CrossFit? Again, there's two different skill levels going on there. So again, I think you know, proper training goes into actual proper technique of the exercise, knowing exercises are good for you, and knowing how to perform those uh, techniques properly is, is just as good as going out there and actually doing the exercises. Sorry, the picture's a little bit fuzzy, but again, kind of talking about genetics. Um, again, all individuals are different, and therefore a routine should be designed specifically to your needs. So, um, if you know somebody's like, well, I'm having trouble getting out of a chair and I have a weaker lower extremity or the legs are weaker. I mean, thinking about exercise to work those areas. Uh, you were talking about your shoulder, if you know, having trouble putting, you know, dishes away or, you know, you know, how do you specifically get a routine for your shoulder, for your arm? So looking at what your specific needs are, um, you know, I go into Walmart and, you know, I can't go, you know, do the three hour shopping spree like I used to go at Walmart. So maybe I can only make one or two passes. So again, I don't have the endurance, the stamina I used to have. So, okay, my specific needs, I need more endurance. So what exercises are gonna influence that? So again, thinking about your needs. Uh, sometimes with my patients, I like to have them kind of write down a little journal and think about things that they go through their day. Um, what kind of specific problems are you having? You know, is it getting out of the, the, you know, the tub? Is it, you know, walking around Walmart? Thinking about those things that you have issues doing and then trying to find exercises that specifically hit those needs and then targeting that. Yes, ma'am. What about reaching the, the very top shelf? Well, exercise can help with that, but again, genetically, again, you're only so tall. But again, I tell my patients, ask me or <laughs> so. But again, it comes to it's like working smarter, not harder. So again, using you know other things, a step stool, uh, somebody to help you out. So again, not torturing yourself to go beyond your physical means, but again. <laughs> But then again, maybe also maybe getting somebody to move those things to lower shelves and stuff to get them within your reach so you're not, again, putting yourself at risk for an injury. But again, maybe moving heavier things or something, to something that's more attainable to you. But again, working smarter, not harder, again, it keeps you from getting hurt. Uh, so again, just realize that everybody is specifically different. So, you know, 
exercising, you know, if somebody does, you know, squats, you know, the results are going to be completely different. So realizing if uh, my friend here does this exercise and if I do the same exact thing, I'm going to get the same results. Not going to happen. So again, I, I stress that individual specific needs, everybody's different. Age, um, we kind of talked about, you know, the body is aging, but again, peak performance physically is usually between the ages of 25, 35. Everybody's going to have a general decline 2% per year until the age of 80. This can actually, doesn't mean 80 or you're done. Uh, this can go on beyond that. I've had patients in their 90s that could run circles around me. Uh, matter of fact, I had a guy that he was uh, 96 years old and he twisted his knee because uh, he, he was on vacation. He was going up and down the, the Colosseum in Rome. He, for exercise, he was just going up and down the steps, you know, fast walking. And of course, they're probably not the best steps. He twisted his knee. So he ended up coming to rehab. Um, and he was like, hey, I got another trip coming up, but we need to get this thing moving. So I was like, no problem. And again, I couldn't tire the man out as hard as I tried. Um, so again, that was something, man, I wish I could do that at 96. Or if I even lived to 96. But the fact that he was, I mean, you know, it was, it was amazing. Um, but again, the, the trick in, when you get older is, again, now you have to get your brain in, in, involved in this. So again, planning out uh, specifically how you're doing things. So, you know, when we're all teenagers and stuff, we kind of go and do it. We don't think about the repercussions things. So we just go out and play until the, you know, it's still dark, until your parents are yelling you to come back in. But again, now you have to start kind of thinking about what and planning out better, like getting the mental preparation. Okay, what do I need to do? How's this going to look? You know, think about it critically because, again, the mental preparation actually helps improve performance. So again, as you see some of these athletes um, thinking in you know, recent years like Michael Jordan, um, you know, when he got into his later 30s and up into 40s, you know, he wasn't dunking on everybody like he was when he was in 20s. His game changed a little bit. He was more of a post-up guy trying to outthink his, athlete, uh, his opponents because he was twice the age. So again, physically he couldn't keep up, but again, he could outsmart them and think about doing things a different way. So again, Thinking about uh, if you're going to the gym, don't try to keep up with people that are you know older, short, uh, you know, shorter, taller, bigger, faster, younger. Work with against what do I need to do? Thinking about how do I, you know I need to prepare against things. Uh, and again, thinking it out ahead of time, I think it helps you get a better performance. Uh, again, more age and Dr. Brooks kind of went over this in a little bit detail. Uh, the physiological things that we can't really change, they're going to happen, but again, the rate of change or how the, the, the detrimental they are to you, these things can be influenced. Um, tissue elasticity, uh, decrease in flexibility, you know, cardiac output, muscle strength and power, um, decrease in bone density, especially in females, and then de uh, decline, uh, decline in rate of tissue repair. Uh, nutrition. Improper nutrition decreases your strength and endurance. Again, you need that fuel, that high octane fuel. If you're putting sludge in your body, um, you're not going to perform very well. I'm sure any of us have eaten, you know, overeaten or eaten just trash. You just don't feel great afterwards. But if you eat real good, you kind of have that natural pep in your step. Uh, again, the better quality of the food you put in, the better you're going to perform. Um, so again, bad fu uh, fuel or food, poor performance. So again, not thinking pro performance in the terms of going out and running a 40-yard dash or, you know, playing in a sport. But again, you know, just walking around like using Walmart again. Days that you feel good, you'll do better. Um, days are not so good, I and mean, we've all had those bad days, you won't perform. So it doesn't have to be in an athletic performance or arena, but again, just normal getting up and walking around during the day. Hydration. I see this a lot because, I mean, I've been guilty of this as well. Uh, water, your body is 60% water on average anyway. If you don't put, you know, water in your body, you don't do very well. Dehydration is a quick way of um, having decreasing performance. And I know a lot of people as they get along, well, I'm busy on this. Did you drink water now? Well, and they grab sodas or this or that. Um, so again, I think if we can just find ways to put water in your diet. I think that'll help out a lot. Um, because you can see, it doesn't take much, a 2% decline in water intake, you're automatically dehydrated. And so as we get older, if you start thinking about the illnesses and things that can come out of that, um, again, that's one of the quick fixes is, again, just make sure you drink plenty of fluids. Um, and so, again, going off, he was talking about protein and carbohydrates. And I think this is uh, an interesting thing that I, I saw in a study recently that, that even individuals in their 80s and 90s, uh, you know, the tissue rate of repair is, you know, slows down a little bit. But, again, I think they were showing that it's not more or less because of um, the rate of tissue. It doesn't have the potential to build up. But, again, it's looking at the diet because... They were saying as we age, we have a less of the protein synthesis sensitivity to the food itself. So, um, whereas you have to, uh, when you're younger, your body pretty much it sees food. Hey, you know, you, you build up muscle and things like that. But as we get older, it takes a little bit more 
to kind of get that thing, the, the system jump started a little bit. So it's your body's sensitivity to the actual the, the nutrients that kind of is a requirement. So it's not, oh, well, you know, I'm 80 or I'm 90, I, I can't build the muscle up there. And well, you know, uh, maybe I, I don't say you have to eat like a T-bone steak or anything every day. But again, just realizing that, again, when you, whatever you ate when you were younger necessarily doesn't need to apply when you're older. So again, you have to take a little bit more of the intake. So sometimes that can relate in the supplements, but I'll kind of talk about that later. But again, going back into nutrition, it just your body is just not as sensitive, just like uh, it, you know, your changes in temperature, the way we see things, we hear, your, your senses are changes as we get older. But the same thing is the way you even absorb food changes as we get older. So you have to adapt your diet to that. Uh, supplements, he talked about the creatine, the HGH. Uh, big thing with supplements, again, I hear this a lot. And, uh, with my patient stuff, they're like, well, what about this? What about this? And they're, they're bringing in all these bottles of supplements that they're taking and stuff. Supplements do not replace a healthy food diet. They're supplements, again, they're an adjunct to it to help you if you can't get to a certain level. But again, popping pills and taking powders and things like that do not replace a healthy meal. So they're saying, well, I'm not going to eat lunch. I'll just, you know, have this, this pill and this shake and this and that. You know, don't use it as, a, again, replacing meals. Use it as an adjunct to your meals. Um, because again, you think about it, there's a million products on the market, but again, as far as the FDA, there's only probably a few agents that actually go and monitor these things. So what you're actually buying in a bottle may not be what's in the bottle. Uh, they have to list a little bit of active ingredients, but sometimes they have that little fine print down here. You don't know really what that is. Um, so again, be really critical and be a, you know savvy consumers because again, just because it says it does this doesn't necessarily mean that's what's going on in that bottle because again, a few agents aren't gonna be able to look at every one million bottles on the market and say, well, this is good, but this is not, there's products coming out every single day. They can't keep up with that load. So again, be very critical of what you're putting in your body. Uh, so again, saying like the misrepresentation on uh, food labels. I'll put this clip if you know, people like to get on the internet. There's this video of Bigger, Stronger, Faster, which kind of goes into this in detail um, without actually putting on there, the gist of it was this guy realized, that, hey, there was a big money market for supplements. So, you know, he hired a bunch of uh, illegal immigrants to take, you know, basically wheat flour and fill little pill capsules out and he sold it, you know, something that took him $5 to make. He was selling for $120 on the market, but really what it was, it was just flour. And so he was selling it as these muscle building agents. Uh, and this goes on a lot, but again, because you just don't know, they, they can write whatever they want on the label, but if nobody catches them, you know, they can get away with it. Um, again, sleep, again, eight to nine hours per day is, is what's needed um, to restore myoglobins, which is kind of your, ba your body's basic fuel source. Um, and again, this is where we talked about the working out is where it's crucial to have that rest period because it takes 24 hours to completely recharge your system back to 100%. Uh, the analogy I like to use is if you think about NBA players, um, Kevin Durant last year. So, you know, he, they made a big deal of all these games in a row that he was, you know, scoring 20, 30 points in a row. And they were talking about, well, that's such a big deal. We were like, well, yeah, he's good. Why can't he score 20, 30 points every single game? But if you think about the NBA schedule, they play back to back to back to back to back. So if you think about, okay, 24 hours, I got my, my fuel tank here at 100%. Next day I'm playing in another city. I didn't have 24 hour rest. I'm playing another game. Yeah, maybe I'll get back to 70%. So you can see there's that general decline in fuel sources. Because again, he just don't have that time to, to rebuild or recharge his battery. So he's, or think about your phone. You know, you, you charge it during the day and you, you play on it all day long and then you go back on it. You only charge it for like a couple hours. The bars don't go back up to full. So you keep knocking that bar down a little bit. Same thing with your body. It needs 24 hours to recharge. So again, think about that from exercise. If you work out your legs, don't work your legs out every single day. Go to your upper body or work something else out. Give those muscle groups time to recover. Focus on something else to give, you know, let them work while the other ones are healing up. Okay, does that make sense? Okay, because I think that's really crucial because a lot of people, well, if I just work out more, no, I mean, because you're really kind of working against yourself. Are, are you talking more about weight training when you say that because if you could ride a bicycle every day, that's not the same kind of intense workout as weightlifting? Very true, but again, it also depends on you as an individual and what your, your activity tolerance is, too. Because again, like, well, I hate to use Lance Armstrong, but Lance Armstrong would probably ride his bike, so his body was conditioned to that. So if you're an individual coming into, say, a workout for the first time, I probably wouldn't jump on there and do 20, 30 minutes of biking every single day or back to back. Let you see how your body responds, because again, there's probably going to be that onset of soreness in the muscles because they are getting used. So again, you may not have to load it up like you would initially. Masters athletes and uh, Olympian stuff, they can get away because they, they, their body's conditioned because they've been doing it for years and years. So individuals that don't get in there, so again, you might have to give yourself, okay, I'm going to do biking this one day. Uh, maybe I'll go walking here. Maybe I'll do you know, swimming. So again, 
still taxing the, the cardiovascular system, but maybe finding a different way of doing it so those muscles can have a way of resting or doing, changing the way they function. So again, they're not doing the same repetitive motion, which causes injury, which sends you to Dr. Brooks. Or uh, again, you're just so sore, I just don't want to move. And then you're, you, know, you have that mentality it's like, wow, exercise really does not feel good because I'm hurting so bad and I never get over the soreness. So therefore, you just don't want to exercise and you kind of shoot yourself down. Uh, proper training, again, we kind of talked about that in detail. As far as skill level, you know, if you're starting a program, learn how to exercise, do the research, don't just jump into a high level CrossFit, you know, Olympic style uh, exercise routine. Look at the, learn the technique, the selection of the exercise, the work volume, and then periodization, basically like meanings, it's like planning out your week. You know, I'm gonna do legs one day, I'm gonna do upper body Tuesday. Writing out a calendar or journal and planning out how you're gonna do or go attack this versus doing the same thing over and over again. Uh, listen to your body, no pain, no gain. It's not necessarily a good thing. Give yourself time to recover. Focus on the, the topics that Dr. Brooks kind of initiated. Uh, exercise can improve uh, performance at any age. Overtraining, here's a couple of things that you start kind of noticing that even with overtraining, you can impair system function, get sick, and uh, develop infections and emotional and sleep disturbances from overworking. So again, it's good to get you healthy, but if you push yourself too far, you can actually go back the other direction too. So again, realizing if you start feeling these things, uh, then again, you're probably pushing yourself too much. So again, change the way you do it, change your calendar to again, to avoid that. Uh, which again, what we're talking about here, the periodization, again, writing a calendar for training, look at your work volumes, uh, how sore do I get after working out, uh, you know, giving yourself time to get those uh, tissues to respond. Uh, and again, it's not bad to take a, a vacation. So some people are like, well, I, I haven't been to the gym in three days. That's okay. Your body sometimes needs a break, just like you don't. You need to get away from your job sometimes. Sometimes you need to get away from exercise for a little bit. Let your body kind of take in all this new change. Uh, so in summary, fitness is important. Uh, here's some of the influence that uh, affect performance as we age. Properly designed fitness programs can maximize functional at any age. Be realistic with your fitness goals. Again, not everybody's going to be Mr. or Mrs. Olympia. So again, work what's good for you as an individual. Uh, overtraining is not a good thing. Questions? Sorry, I know I ripped kind of fast through that last little bit. Everyone just uh, stay seated for one moment. Uh, we have, I think, a very special treat today. It is uh, my honor and pleasure to introduce a patient of both mine and Chad's, um, Professor Andre Landry. Uh, Dr. Landry is a 69-year-old gentleman whose ACL I reconstructed several months ago. And, if any of you know anything about athletic injuries, you're like, why in God's name would you reconstruct the ACL on a 69-year-old? I'm going to have him come up and tell you why. A little bit about Dr. Landry. He's a uh, graduate of Texas A&M University in Galveston. Uh, he was a professor there for about 40 years. We trained a number of people in uh, the uh, study of fisheries and uh, sea turtles. He has uh, been the author or co-author on a hundred scientific articles. And uh, he's married to his sweetheart of 48 years and has several children and grandchildren of whom he is very proud. And again, I'd like to uh, bring up uh, Dr. Andre Landry, please. Well, I've been blessed with a career that uh, basically necessitated a lot of activity as a field biologist, somebody that trained undergraduates and graduate students, as well as collections of, of data that enabled my career, publishing, contracts, grants. I was always out in the field. And out in the field was basically being trudging through water, mud, things like that. I still do that today, and I'm excited about that because that's a part of me, that's a part of my love, and basically Mother Nature. I, I try to wade fish twice a week. My uh, training regimen is typically one day, I mean, uh, a week that has five days of activity at the gym. It reflects a great deal of what these two gentlemen have. Uh, uh, basically recommended. I do high impact weight training three days a week, every other day. I combine that with what I call cross training for cardiovascular fitness, elliptical, uh, treadmill, and bike. And those kinds of things are things that do more for me mentally than anything else. Uh, it enables me to say, golly, I accomplished something today for a <laughs> gift that God gave me, and that was good health, plus a family that's active. We've got four very active children, as well as nine very active grandchildren. And 
we have a role model, I feel, my wife and I, to say, hey, this is what we want to do to make every day that special. Health is something that we're all blessed with, and if you can take it to the max, that's my philosophy. One of the things that certainly I've enjoyed, particularly from the standpoint of being with Dr. Brooks, is his enthusiasm for pushing the body. Now, that doesn't mean there are limits. You establish your own limits, just like Chad said. But I always look for uh, a limit that basically is a goal every day. When I work with Chad or with Kat, it's basically in a rehab situation that is, I look for pushing that limit a little bit more because I feel that that's going to give me a little bit more for tomorrow if God gives me tomorrow. Uh, my injuries, I've had two uh, knee surgeries this year, one an ACL and another uh, meniscus. The ACL was a skiing injury, the ACL was a fishing injury, and, uh, but that didn't stop me. Uh, I've had two shoulder reconstructions, replacements, and that has not stopped me from high impact um, weightlifting. I've had two pacemaker implants, that has not stopped me. I've got an active wife that says, hey, these are the things that we're going to do today, and we look forward to that and enabling those things to, to take about both for our own good and particularly for our children is what good health and, and maintaining it. So I'm very, very honored to be here, but I have a lot to be thankful for. And I think everybody, as Chad said and as Dr. Brooks says, has a knowledge of what your body can maintain. And if you just take it to that level, no matter how large or how small, both mentally and physically, you'll have a much, much better day. Thank you Any questions for Dr. Landry? Where do you work out? Are you working out with them or do you have a trainer? Well, when I get together with them, it's a workout. <laughs> uh, they have to mop the floor with sweat. I'm a big sweater. And I told them the other day that thank, godness, uh, thank goodness I didn't have Ebola because everybody would be in fact <laughs> at, at the, at, but um, other than rehab, I work out at the South Shore Fitness Center. Oh, I never see you there. You're, are you sure? That's <laughs> <laughs> I'm there. That's my second home. Is it? <laughs> yep. I'm there typically on certain days from 10 to 12, and then on other days from 1 to 3. Oh, I'm going to look for you. Okay. You can, we can work out together. I was just going to ask you, which did you think was a harder rehab, the shoulder or the knee? Um, patient perspective. <laughs> well, uh, shoulder replacements are not fun, and a lot of that was uh, a, a result of all of the activity that I spent with uh, our sons, football and, and baseball. But um, these guys have made the, the knees, the knee operations that I've had, uh, I won't say a pleasure, but much, much less stressful, uh, both mentally and physically. Shoulder replacements. Whew. But that doesn't mean you can't have one. The ligaments and the tendons and put them onto something new. That's hard rehab. Yeah. yeah. That was inspirational. Do you have a question in the corner? Yes, ma'am. Uh, I have a question about um, trainers. Um, there, are, you know, we all see these trainers that are all bulky and wonderful and all that kind of thing. I would feel very intimidated going to that trainer. I think many of us don't know how to put together an individual routine that's appropriate to where we are in our life. Um, what do you recommend that we, when we interview a trainer, what is it that we should ask? What should we be looking for? Okay, so my, my first thing is like, are the trainers telling you what you need to do or are they allowing you to have a two-way conversation with me? The first thing I would, because Again, a lot of people go on the credentials like, well, I'm huge, therefore I know. Uh, and again, they just do what they do and it works for them, but what they do may not work for you. So, uh, you know, if the individual is kind of dictating, okay, you're pretty much a passive component in the, in the interviews process, and they're telling you, okay, we're going to do this, we're going to do this, we're going to put on this much muscle, we're going to burn this much fat, and they're pretty much just laying it out there and you're not really getting any input, I would say that's a bad recipe for disaster. 
Um, because they, they're not learning about you. I mean, what are your needs? What are you, what are you want? What are you having trouble doing? What about your medical history? What kind of things do they need to be aware of? So again, I think it needs to be a two-way street. So, you know, looking at them as from a background standpoint, what are their credentials? Are they just, okay, I'm a, I'm a gym rat? Or do they actually have, you know, a background in academics that they've learned and studied their craft? Or again, they just relying on, hey, I did this, and so this will work for everybody else. But again, I think there needs to be a two-way street because again, you need to be, you need to buy into, you need to have a contract that individual, not just have them yell and bark at you and tell you what you need to do. Because again, and, you're an active component. Dr. And Lindsay. do you like the idea of people going to a trainer to get that basic recipe? It depends on the trainer. It really is. Just like anybody, there's there's bad doctors, there's bad therapists, there's bad trainers. So I think you need to do your background check. So if they're good, I have no problem with it. Because again, I'd rather you be doing something than nothing at all. But at the same time, I don't want you doing things that are going to be detrimental or cause you to be worse in rehab or cause you to end up seeing uh, Dr. Brooks. So again, picking, you know, you've got to interview these individuals and again, finding out what they're about and how it's going to work for you individually. Dr. Landry, one quick question for you on that. Um, prior to meeting us because of your injuries, did you speak with a professional about how to design your workout program? It's something you just developed on your own over the years. Did you do your own research? How did you come about doing your own cross-training, weightlifting program, et cetera? Uh, no, I, I've never gone to a trainer. My wife has, but I haven't. And my uh, high-impact weight training has basically been an essential part of my life as a high school uh, athlete and then one in college as well as with uh, boys that uh, I worked out with religiously. I'm a lot less built now than I was back then, but that's not important to me. What's important to me is pushing the limits with regard to different muscle groups, particularly the compound uh, exercises, working the back and, for instance, the, the biceps as, as Dr. Brooks. Uh, but I would, I would say if, if you need a trainer, get one. Uh, they will bring you along, just as the rehab people have taken me along. They have to work with some people that are highly, highly restricted. I've been fortunate, and they have taken me to, to uh, areas that uh, I didn't think I could go to. UTMB Health, working together to work wonders.